We're so excited and honored to have uh, the Good Grief Network here to uh, facilitate a workshop on eco distress and climate grief for you. So I'll start off by introducing Sarah. Um, Sarah, whose pronouns are she, her, is a facilitator, writer, lawyer, and the executive director of the Good Grief Network. Sarah followed her passion for environmental activism and earned a JD with a certificate in environmental and natural resources law from Lewis and Clark Law School. She studied and practiced international environmental and human rights law, climate justice activism, early childhood development, introspective and body-based therapies, and community resilience building. Sarah first found Good Grief Network as a 10-step program participant while looking for ways to navigate the emotional challenges of living in joy and service during uncertain times. Our other facilitator from Good Grief Network is Andrew. Andrew is a Good Grief Network flow facilitator based in North Carolina, where he works for a campaign to end child hunger and spends his free time making films and drawing. In his, his facilitation work with Good Grief Network, Andrew draws inspiration and insight from the solar punk movement to spark meaningful discussions on climate grief. So thank you both so much for being here. And with that, um, please take it away. Hi, everyone. It's nice to see you. It's really nice to be here. Um, Andrew and I are on screen. We're the two folks from Good Grief Network here. Um, and I'm really grateful that y'all have chosen to be with us today. And I'm just thankful that you're interested in exploring climate emotions, because I think this is an essential way that we are going to navigate the future that's ahead of us. We wanna honor and, and acknowledge that y'all are coming from a variety of pathways to this work and to this community and this movement. But I wanna invite y'all to check in through chat because this emotions work really requires us to be in community and try to feel close. And so in this way, we can get to know each other a little bit. So you can use the chat and tell us um, what's your name, where are you calling in from and what brought you to this work and this movement. And I'll just give us a few seconds to look at the chat and see who's here with us. And you heard my bio, you heard Andrew's bio, and we'd love to hear from y'all too. And I'll just give y'all a little bit of an agenda of what we're doing as we're waiting for that. Um, we're in this workshop together, caring for ourselves and our communities in chaotic times. We're gonna spend some time here talking about our climate emotions and the importance of noticing and honoring and processing those emotions as part of our movement work. And um, we're also gonna practice some skills that you can use individually and collectively within your communities to build resilience. We're gonna model some exercises for you. And these are exercises that you can use again to work with your own emotions. And some of these exercises won't work for you. Some of they will, some of them will. And as they say in Al-Anon, which is Adult Children of Alcoholics, and that is the program that inspired a lot of our peer-to-peer -peer support work at Good Grief Network, they say, take what you like and leave the rest. And I would like to extend that invitation to you. Just as another note, again, Andrew and I are peer-to-peer -peer support group facilitators. We're not therapists. So we come to you from the lens of folks who have done this work in community, not in the mainstream conventional psychiatric or psychological lens, not from the mental health sphere, but from the peer support community building sphere. Um, and there will be points where we ask you for your participation and your engagement. And as facilitators, we're so used to being in community with you and seeing all of your faces and we don't have the reactions available to us. So I just encourage you to please engage as much as you can, use the chat so that we know how you're feeling about things. And be mindful of your body as we're engaging in some of these exercises. Heed your body's wisdom over our instructions and just be respectful, be careful and intentional with your words. Okay, so we're gonna go right into this. Um, we are here from Good Grief Network. This is who's hosting this workshop and we are a Michigan US-based nonprofit organization and we create spaces where people can come together and metabolize our heavy and painful feelings about the state of the world and do deep inner work to figure out what work is ours to do in times of great disruption and transformation. We at GGN are best known for our flagship program, which is again, a peer support group, and it's called 10 Steps to Resilience and Empowerment in a Chaotic Climate. It was created by Good Grief Network's co-founders, Laura Schmidt and Amy Lewis Rowe, and they have an amazing book coming out in August that we are going to link you to later that I highly recommend. And aside from our flagship program, GGN runs facilitation trainings. We have a teen resilience program, book clubs, 
journaling programs, vigils that we hold, and other peer support spaces. And like I said, we're normally in a peer support space where we can feel you. So do whatever you can with this chat and let us know what, what's resonating with y'all. And we're going to have Andrew lead us off in a grounding exercise, as we often do. Thanks, Sarah. We're starting all of our workshops and meetings with a grounding exercise. Uh, it's how we arrive to our bodies and to the space. We're all coming from somewhere and going somewhere after this. And we want to arrive to these spaces grounded because it helps us to do this work in community from a place of presence and choice and trust and self-responsiveness. Uh, because all emotions are welcome, it, the purpose isn't necessarily to calm us down, just to ground us and, and get us in touch with our bodies and, and the moment. Uh, so this is called the five, four, three, two, one orientation. And it's kind of an invitation to dig into our senses. Uh, you can do it in your head or you can write it down, whichever feels better for you. But uh, to start off, I'll invite you to just get comfortable if you're in a seated position, maybe getting your feet flat on the ground and really feeling the, the earth and ground deep below you, taking a few breaths to, to get situated and calm. So as we count down from five to one for each number, we're gonna name that many things based on a specific sense. So we'll start off with five and we'll name to ourselves five things you can see. Starting with five things you can see. If you're in a familiar environment, you might wanna really focus on noticing a new detail about something like the purple fringe on the leaves of your house plant with the moisture that's stuck in between the window panes on your glass door. Five things you can see. Next, we'll do four things you can hear. Four things you can hear. You can name them in your own head. You can write them down, but these are for you, just for you to experience. Again, if you're in a familiar space, you might really focus on noticing something new, if you can, about a sound that you hear often. The air conditioning, the fridge, your stomach gurgling. Number three is things you can feel. Find three things you can feel. I'll add in as you do that all of our grounding exercises are, are invitations, not requirements. Participate them as you feel able or interested in doing so. If you wanna adjust them to be better suited to you, you're welcome to. Two is things you can smell. Two things you can smell. Feel free to reach for something too if you've got a tea or a drink nearby. I'm gonna take a whiff of that. As you can smell. And finally, we do one thing you can taste. One thing you can taste.
Hope you're feeling a little more grounded. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're with us. Sarah. Thank you, Andrew. <clears throat> that really helps me. Um, I hope it helps y'all too. It's nice to arrive to a space. Um, normally, when Good Grief Network opens a workshop, we would spend some time talking about how we got here, what brought us to this place on earth, what's driving climate crisis, and the challenges to being a change maker in these times. But I think that if you're at a solar punk conference, you know why we're here. Um, you know what's brought us here. And so I just want to introduce a few terms that we're going to use a lot during this workshop so that we're all on the same page. And the first is the term planetary predicament. And we use that term to refer to why we're here. And what we mean by that is this intersectional nature of this predicament that we're in. And we refer to it as a predicament instead of a problem because problems can be easily solved, but predicaments are very complex. And in this case, we're talking about overlapping ecological, social, political, economic crises. And so that's what we mean by planetary predicament. And, um, you know, we're all here doing the work, imagining these better worlds that our hearts know are possible, that our minds know are possible, but it's really undeniable that we're gonna feel heavy feelings along the way. And, I imagine that many of y'all have felt those feelings. I know I have, they've completely transformed my life, my career, my relationships. And um, there are some catch-all terms that have been used in the environmental community to refer to these feelings like climate grief, eco-grief, eco-anxiety. And we're gonna use instead the term eco-distress because we think it helps cover the wide spectrum of emotions that are really healthy responses to this time. So that includes feelings like rage and numbness and despair in addition to grief and anxiety. And so we'll use the term eco distress. And so if you hear us saying that, that's the term we're gonna use to refer to some of these climate emotions. Uh, so Sarah asked us to check in a little earlier with the question of, of what brought us to these movements. Uh, and my own answer to that check-in question is that I came to, to Good Grief Network specifically with a, a real deep worry that I was wrong to feel ego distress. Uh, I really started on the doomer side of things when it comes to my first exposure to like serious climate science and, and culture. It was all very pessimistic and fatalistic for me. Uh, and the more I read, the more afraid I got and the more convinced I became that things were hopeless. And regardless of, of whether those convictions were accurate or not, or proved to be accurate or not, I recognized how miserable I felt, how alone I felt. And I recognized, I think, on some kind of objective level that I needed to expose myself to some other perspectives. Not to mention there was like a, uh, like a shame aspect to feeling pessimistic in the face of, you know, a lot of rhetoric out there about hope and the power of hope and the necessity of hope. So through Good Grief Network and, and other connections, I was really relieved to find that I didn't need to swing completely to the opposite end of a pendulum, but it was okay and, and maybe even good to find a balance between all of these feelings. Um, a place, as we say at the start of most of our meetings, a place between unrealistic optimism and resigned nihilism. Uh, and I don't think there's ever any end to that journey, but I do think you can reach a place where you're, you know, days feel like you're fine tuning that balance more than you're digging out of a hole all the time. Uh, maintaining that balance is ongoing work, though, as our, as our uh, one of our founders, Laura, has said, the despair doesn't go away, but my relationship to it changes. I'm guessing a lot of you can relate to some of these feelings. Uh, are you sometimes overwhelmed with heavy and painful feelings over the state of the world? If so, you are not alone. It's normal, in fact, to feel heavy and painful feelings. It's normal to feel despair, grief, hopelessness, helplessness, rage. These feelings are healthy reactions to a deeply troubled way of being, a deeply troubled world that, that we come into, reformed. Uh, but what do we do with them? Um, we normalize them. We reduce feelings of isolation. We try not to pathologize our eco distress or climate grief. We don't think someone is ill if they're exhibiting heavy or painful feelings. 
uh, you know, it could become clinical. It could mesh with or merge into depression or anxiety, suicidal thoughts or ideation. But our focus is on taking these feelings and transforming them and letting them transform us, uh, learning to process heavy and painful feelings and to see what wisdom we can glean from them uh, by moving through those heavy feelings. What might our feelings teach us about doing things differently as individuals and as a collective? I think that sometimes collectives, activists might speak out against acknowledging painful feelings because they worry that they don't motivate people to act in the best way, that it's logical to spend time on them. Uh, but heavy and painful feelings are rarely fully logical. And I think we still need a place in our movements uh, for them because processing them demands uh, that if we want to welcome everyone in. Again, if you feel these things, you're not alone. Uh, far from it. Uh, one of the times I feel least alone is at the start of the 10-step cycle meetings that we do. Uh, we always start off in the first meeting and we've got like 12 complete strangers there on Zoom looking back at you. And my feeling is always inevitably, no matter how many times I've done it, like, oh man, these people are going to think this is so weird. I'm about to start talking about like heart-centered revolutions. And I'm about to like share personal feelings with these strangers and, and try and encourage them to be vulnerable. And I'm so sure that they're all going to be logged off by the end of the two hours. Uh, it never happens. Inevitably, by the end of the two hours, not only are they still there, there's a feeling of relief on their faces. It's, it's mixed in with the heaviness of these painful feelings we're talking about. But there's a sense of not being alone. There's a sense of community. There's a sense of realization that there are others out there dealing with the same things and that together we can find ways forward. Mm, thank you, Andrew. I feel that too. Um, and actually, Andrew and I have sat in a few 10 step groups together where we've each facilitated each other. And that feeling really does sink in when you leave your first meeting. And the first step is, in our 10 step program is accept the severity of the predicament. So there's this feeling that we're coming in heavy, but it actually is incredibly warming and um, buoyant to feel this kind of support around us. And um, there's someone named Britt Ray who writes the Substack in the book, Generation Dread. And she says, ego distress needs to rise to the surface and then be met head on for the transformative work to begin. And we really believe that. And we think that the way to meet head on these feelings of ego distress are through processing them processing them so they can transform us. And I just want to talk about what it means to transform ourselves through our feelings. What does it mean when we're talking about developing emotional intelligence or what does it mean to do the emotional processing work? We hear these terms thrown around a lot, but we want to really ground this workshop in some practice. And what we mean by that is the process of taking time to develop skills that help us acknowledge and name our emotions and these vivid inner landscapes that we're living through. We want to learn tools to increase our capacity to regulate these feelings so that we can experience greater states of centeredness, even in really challenging situations. We can expand our window of tolerance. And we want to practice these tools in order to access more agency and more choice and more responsiveness in how these feelings actually impact our lives because our emotional landscapes are impacting our mindset, our thinking, our behaviors, our art all the time. And we create more opportunities for connection and opening and opportunity when we're able to be more in touch with these feelings. And so there are a lot of different ways that we can process our feelings and we can cope and we'll share some of them later. But I also just wanna name that this is another take what you like and leave the rest moment. Maybe talk therapy works for you, maybe breathing or exercises involving mindfulness work for you. Maybe it's moving your body. And all of these are really valid ways to process our feelings based on your own comfort. So we get the question a lot. Why are we sitting around processing our feelings when the world is burning? Why are we sitting here and taking time to talk about this when the planetary predicament is so intense and intensifying all the time? And that's because the dominant culture that we live in is constructed on the premise that we are logical beings, but we are not. We are completely emotional beings that are often responding based on those emotions instead of logic. 
And like I said, our behaviors, our art, our actions, our relationships are always impacted by our emotional state. And we've been taught to ignore that, right? We've been taught to disregard that emotional state. And in doing so, what we end up doing is reacting based on that emotional state instead of creating the spaces for discernment so that we can have some space between our emotional state and solve really intense problems from a more grounded place. And it's very difficult to tackle a global, nuanced, incredibly complex crisis like the climate emergency if we are in a reactive state rather than a discerning state. So I just wanna ground us in that reality that emotional processing is absolutely a survival skill as we're moving forward. And those are the kind of skills that are gonna bring us into life-sustaining paradigms because when we're trapped in our fear responses, we can't be creative. And we need to be able to start being creative and noticing the openings, noticing the spaces for new thinking. And these emotional processing skills really do help us protect not only our, ourselves, but our, our hearts, our minds, our inspiration, our sanity. As we're moving through this world and times are intensifying, we need these skills. And I wanna note something important, which is that myself personally, but also at Good Grief Network, we don't see this emotional processing is some antidote to eco distress. We're, we're not trying to cure anything here. We're trying to understand that these emotions are going to come in waves and we're gonna have seasons where we're in and out of them. And so what we're learning to do is befriend these emotions and learning how to navigate them. And like I say, we're inviting them in for tea. They're a friend that we're inviting in for tea, but they cannot stay. These are not overnight guests, some of these emotions. We get to work with them a little bit and then tell them when their time is to go. So we never stop at the emotional processing. We really use it as a tool for figuring out what our action is, where we're going to plug into this work as we move forward. And what I really mean by that is that when we are individually well-regulated, and Andrew, would you share? Oh, you're on it. I love that. Thank you. Um, love this teamwork. Um, so I just want to talk about, I'm going to talk about a little bit about individual emotional processing and then what happens when we do emotional processing in groups and collectives. And so what I really mean by um, this being a survival and resilience skill is that when we're individually well-regulated, we can show up calm and steady enough to participate in our community and build healthy relationships. We reconnect to creativity, inspiration, and innovation, right? When we're gripped by our fight, flight, freeze responses, that's a cognitive block. That, that's fear and rage and numbness that do not allow us to connect to this creativity and inspiration. But when we're emotionally well-regulated, we can be a little more calm and curious, compassionate. Also, we develop mindfulness and somatic awareness through individual emotional processing. We learn to listen to ourselves and our bodies and what they actually need, which is really radical in these times. We learn to slow down. And we also build these really authentic connections with others by being curious. And I think this is really important, especially in movement spaces. When we live less in those fear responses, I keep naming those defense mechanisms in our stories, we're more able to show up for other people. And we're more able to show others who we truly are, receive them as they truly are, and see new sides of ourselves and new sides of people rather than rushing to judgments. Um, you know, this curiosity and compassion, this way that we try to accept people really helps us build trusting relationships. And I think that if we are going to tackle this enormous crisis at our hands, we really need a unified group of people that trust each other because humans no doubt work best together when we've built trust and care in collectives. And so that's individual processing. Now, when we are collectively well-regulated, not just individually, but when we are collectively well-regulated, we can use our imaginations to collectively transition ourselves into new paradigms, into new futures, into regenerative life-sustaining worlds. And we've seen this happen many times in the past, right? We are able to practice listening and sharing. We create spaces to not rush to judge or fix anyone, but to sit with unanswerable questions. We practice being vulnerable, sitting with discomfort, and witnessing each other. And we don't shy away from that discomfort or that tension, we can lean into it a little more. And we create the literal practice grounds for the challenging conversations that we're gonna need to have in groups as we shift into new paradigms, as we each act out this heart-centered revolution.
Um, collectively well-regulated groups also have reduced isolation, right? We don't feel so separated. We see each other and we feel seen. We normalize these heavy feelings and it reminds us that the world's pain is our pain because this is an enormous biosphere of which we are a part and we are interconnected. And it also helps us remember that we don't need to solve these problems alone and we can show up to community more consistently when we feel like we're all solving problems together. Collectively well-regulated groups also have increased abilities to hold each other accountable and repair harm. Um, community members are more accountable to each other when they've spent the time building the depth of relationships that we're able to build when we work on ourselves and our inner landscapes. And finally, this is something we're gonna talk about later, co-visioning, co-creating an emergence. When, our, when we're doing the individual and collective work in our emotions, um, we can unblock those cognitive blocks to our imagination. We can create, we can vision together, and we're not afraid of saying new ideas in groups. We're not afraid that that new idea is gonna scare anybody away or be too much. And I think that's a really important thing to name, why it's important to do this work. And I think sometimes, and Andrew, you can take those slides down. Thank you. Thank you. Um, appreciate that. Um, I think sometimes it's really hard to do the inner work. And I just want to name that in this space, particularly because we're at a solar punk conference um, and we're in this movement. And a lot of us have committed to telling different stories and the ones our culture has been telling us. And the inner work can get dark and we need to name that. Um, especially in these spaces where we're making time to tell different stories, we might feel like there's not a place in these movements for the darkness or the hard parts of this inner work. And I just wanna name that the same systems that are destroying ecosystems and any chance of habitable living on earth work by disconnecting us from ourselves, by disconnecting us from each other, and by disconnecting us from the more than human world. So it's really radical to decide that we're going to choose connection. We're going to choose emotional heart-centered connection. And um, it helps us move toward healing, right? When we reconnect to our full selves, and that includes the dark, messy parts, in addition to the inspired, beautiful, joyful parts, we can embrace our full selves holistically and really understand that in a deeply interconnected world, Fragment and isolation are what the powers that be want us to be focusing on. The, those, that fragmentation and isolation causes harm, but it's also what allows us to have a cognitive dissonance and numb out sometimes. Um, and I just want to briefly introduce a little bit of my story, which is that um, I, I was a lawyer. I was a climate change and human rights lawyer. And the legal field that I worked in really heavily focused on this outer work, right? And um, you know, I think the inner work and outer work are intricately related, but as an advocate, I was really taught to focus on the outer work, what I'm doing out in the world. And the legal system didn't have the mechanisms in place to help people tend to the inner work. Um, I ultimately left the field and found a bunch of other stepping stones that brought me to this work. And I actually have learned that it's my very vivid emotional landscape that makes me the activist and advocate that I am, which I think is a very powerful asset. And what I've really learned since starting to tend to that inner work in my personal and professional life is that the inner and outer work are intricately related. They're inextricably related. Um, the, my inner work sustains my outer work. The time I spend on myself is why I can keep showing up in my community. And I think that it might be the case with many people, with maybe many of y'all. When we attend to our nervous systems, when we heal our traumas, and we process some of these really heavy feelings, we're better resourced, right? We're better community members and we're more nimble as change makers. Um, and I think we really just need to touch these things that conventional society doesn't want us to touch, right? Our cultural norms drive us to overwork and burn out so that we're not thinking about these feelings. We tell ourselves we can't afford to do the work because there's so much else to do. We can't afford to do the inner work because there's so much work out in the world to do. But it's, I think, this avoidance of the inner work that allows us to stay disconnected and maintain that cognitive dissonance. Um, so what we're really trying to do is ask new and ancient questions and develop a dedication to worldview change. And that requires us knowing ourselves. And knowing ourselves require us to, requires us to spend some of this time on this inner work. So 
Thank you. That was a lot of talking at y'all. Um, and again, it's not super comfortable in the webinar settings. I want to hear your voices and be with you and, and be in community. So I'm going to lead us in a breathing exercise. And even though I can't hear your voices, I will imagine you breathing with me. Um, this is another invitation for y'all. This is a breathing technique you can use on your own when you're feeling overwhelmed. It's great because it's quick. It is discreet. So you can use it in a social setting, a professional setting, and it really does help activate the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the system in us that leads to a state of calm and rest. And this breathing technique is called 478. It was developed by Dr. Andrew Weil to help people sleep. Um, and because of that long exhale, we activate the system that brings us into a state of rest. So what it is, is an inhale through the nose for a count of four. Then we hold our breath at the top of the breath for a count of seven. And then it's a long exhale through the mouth. That's a long and steady exhale for a count of eight. And we'll exhale through our lips like this as if we're blowing up a balloon. So I'm going to model this. You can count along with me and start right away. Or if you want to see, so we will do this. You can do it with me together or I'll model the first one and then we'll do a few together. So I'm going to start with the inhale through the nose. Okay. So again, that's an inhale for four through the nose. You kind of hold your breath at the top of that inhale for seven and an exhale for eight. Y'all want to do one together? Cool. Okay. Let's breathe through our noses. I'll count you off. Great, y'all. Let's do one more just to practice this together. Okay. And I won't count this time. Let's just do it together, but I'll start now. Thank y'all. I want to invite you as you do this in the future to just put a hand over your heart and notice how your heart slows on that long exhale. It's really amazing. These are ways we can bring ourselves back into a state of centeredness when we feel overwhelmed and they're really easy pocket tools. Thanks for sharing the screen, Andrew. <clears throat> you bet. Thank you for, for leading us in that, Sarah. I was pacing around my house before this started. I was like, oh, I'm so nervous about presenting. And I was like, oh wait, I have, I have tools for this. So this is the second 478 meeting I've done today. Um, talking about grounding practices, talking about conversations about rest and care. We really wanna dig into how rest and care are essential to figuring out how to sustain ourselves in the long term. Uh, I think that's missing from a lot of the ways we talk about being agents of change, possibly because we're afraid that if people do take breaks, they might not return uh, to the work. But from our experience, uh, we see the opposite. It's the lack of breaks and lack of care that burn people out beyond return. These conversations are important because they disrupt the machine, they disrupt the system. Uh, and in many ways, advocacy and, and movements and work are, are, are systems too. Uh, they're systems of change, but they're systems that have been built off the models that we already have because they're the only models we know, most of which are based in capitalism or, or white supremacy. Uh, burnout is built into the culture of activism. You know, think about how many times you've heard the phrase self-sacrifice in relation to activism or, or nonprofits or other work. Uh, this culture is extractive, it's exploitative, because it asks us to work beyond our means. Uh, we perpetuate the problems that we're trying to solve within professional and movement spaces when we do things like work without taking breaks, 
work without rest, when we reward people who overachieve or overwork, or when we glamorize the grind or sleepless nights. Uh, you know, these things are doing a disservice to the work itself and the people that carry the work forward. And they're doing a disservice to future generations who are looking to us to model a way forward, a new way forward. Our response to this needs to be normalizing different ways of practicing self-care or prioritizing breaks and rest and realizing that this work can't continue without them. Uh, even adjacent to activism and movements, I think just staying aware of what's going on in the world can be an exploitative system. Uh, you know, say, say yes in the chat, maybe if you follow more than one source of climate news online, and then say yes again in all caps if you've ever had to take a break from that climate news because it's too overwhelming. Uh, I, feel, I think I feel like a compulsion to absorb everything that I can when it comes to that kind of stuff. And it feels like the compulsion often transitions into a responsibility feeling to absorb everything. Responsibility to be informed, to figure out what information is correct, to have the latest information that's coming faster than ever, and also to absorb like that pain we see going on with other people in, in, in the news. Uh, we also want to look at changing our culture around rest and self-care as it applies to stories and narrative, right? There's a capitalist and white supremacist impulse to always be measuring ourselves by our productivity. How many pages did I write today? How many prints have I sold this month? And so part of our work too is to fight against that, disrupt that thinking, give ourselves permission to ignore those impulses sometimes. Uh, it, that it's okay to be still, that it's okay to do nothing sometimes. We can't create stories or movements or new realities without some rest. There's validity in doing nothing. Witnessing is not a passive act. And uh, being there for others, being a person of non-action, it's, it's not a wrong thing. I love this phrase, non-action. There's uh, an eco-philosopher named Donna Haraway who thinks a lot about new ways to tell stories. And this is a quote from her. She encourages us to think about the children of compost the children of the soil, of the underground, of the dark, of the night, of incapacity, of non-action, of non-success. Not as a bad thing, but as that soil within which human souls and perhaps not just human souls are made. So I love this idea of the compost pile where things are being reabsorbed and reborn and we know these extractive systems infect not just us as storytellers, uh, but the stories themselves, right? You know, we've all heard these narrative rules that require three acts and a resolution and a protagonist who's relentlessly pursuing a goal. And, and so I wonder a lot with that heroic quote about uh, what a protagonist of non-action looks like. Uh, just like we said about the news, we have more to process and digest than ever right now. And so maybe that, that idea of a compost pile is what's needed for some of us, at least some of the time. Uh, and so in that spirit, we're going to, for our next grounding exercise, do absolutely nothing. Um, on the one hand, no phone, no new browser windows, no Discord, I'll check the timestamps later. But on the other hand, no special breathing, no mantras, no instructions, this is an invitation to just be, just exist in the compost pile, however it feels right to you. So we'll put a little timer for just a couple of minutes on it and this time is your own.
Thank you guys for trying that out with us. I hope you'll add some little moments of non-action, some little moments in the compost pile to your, your self-care toolkit. Thanks, Andrew. That was the most nothing I've done all day. I loved that. Um, and yeah, I just wanna name that these ways of interrupting this capitalistic conditioning that is so present in our movements, you know, we're, we're still told to exploit ourselves toward overwork in so many spaces. Um, these are really revolutionary ways of being. And so if it doesn't feel comfortable right away, that's okay. Give yourself some patience and grace um, and allow yourself to try out a few things to take care of yourself, remembering that taking care of yourself is really important in a world where we are a small group of people committed to this type of storytelling. We really need our spirit intact. And um, these types of practices really help us avoid perpetuating these problems of exploitation within our own movement spaces. So try to introduce them into your communities. Um, we're really working hard to figure out how to show up for ourselves and each other in a way that doesn't burn us out. And as times intensify, that gets harder. Um, and when we're under-resourced and especially chronically under-resourced, which I'm sure some of y'all understand and feel as well, um, we can't actually do the work in a way that helps move our missions forward. Um, so I just want to quickly name this idea of the quality of how we show up. Um, another eco-philosopher, Joanna Macy, says sometimes, and this is not a direct quote, so forgive me, but it's a quote I love. She says, sometimes my level of hope depends on what I ate for breakfast. You know, like sometimes we are just underfed or underrested. Um, we're tired, we're grumpy, we're reactive, we're in our head about something else, we're in a fight with our partner or family member, and that will affect our quality of showing up to each other and to this work. And so um, our own state really does impact our ability to solve problems and think critically. So it's a way to check in with ourselves and just ask before we show up to important meetings, to important relationships, like how is, how is my quality of showing up right now? It's a really important question that gives us a lot of agency in how we move through the world. And it's also a boundaries practice. And this world would love us to have no boundaries and boundaries are, yeah, sure, that's how the hardest thing around, but having them and honoring them is how we signal to our community that we can be trusted, that we can be trusted with the tasks at hand because they know that when we feel like we're overextending our boundaries, we're gonna bow out. And so having boundaries also gives our community members permission to have boundaries themselves. And that's a really important part of building these movements. Um, and you know, as we continue working toward systems that avoid us burning out, um, or if we, I should say differently, like if we continue to burn ourselves out, we're gonna lose the thread that connects us to why we did this work to begin with. That's what burnout does. It, for, it forgets what thread this is. And it's so important for us to remember our why. And it was the checking question. It's something Andrew mentioned again, and it's something we wanna to talk to y'all about here as well. Yeah, one way we do the work in an inspiring and energizing way is to rediscover our why. Why do we do this work? Uh, there's this Nietzsche quote that we all discovered through Viktor Frankl and we're sharing all the time. Those who have a why to live can bear almost any how. Uh, we spend a lot of time figuring out how we'll make it through this planetary predicament, but we wanna reframe that question as why do we want to make it through this planetary predicament? Um, there's a point at which we remember the joy and love that made us commit to this work in the first place. So you, you, what do we love so much about the world that made us become change makers or radicals or storytellers or solar punks? And how does the stress of work and culture take us away from those whys? Uh, who and what systems are served by us forgetting our whys? Uh, basically, you know, this all boils down to bringing it together with an, uh, another reminder to, to slow down and take breaks, to avoid self-indulgence and focus on the regenerative, to connect to what helps us come alive, what fills our cups, so to speak, and making time to remember where our skills, experiences, and passions intersect, because that is how we align our lives with our action. I'll say that one, one more time, where our skills, 
experiences and passions intersect because that's how we align our whys with our action. I, I'm, I'm guessing that a lot of people here at a solar punk conference have discovered to some degree their why. And that's, you know, why we named uh, that in the check-in too. The reason we come to this work is what helps guide us through challenging times. Um, but we know, we know it's inevitable that we'll get distracted or overwhelmed at times. So I think it's helpful to find practices and people and things that are going to return you to that why, you know, the run you take every morning at the lake and the way the water looks in the morning. Andrew Sage this morning talked about the garden that he's growing and, and seeing the slow progress of the garden. You know, it could be, it could be a moleskin notebook with Luke Skywalker on the cover where you've kept inspirational quotes for the past 10 years. I don't know. It could be your grandma's layer chocolate icing cake recipe that she handed down to you. What are the things that are going to help you retouch and, and, and continue with that, with that why? Thank you, Andrew. I actually, you know, we have like a whole workshop and we have our outline to the side and we're running through it really well right now, but I'm just going to pause that for a second and ask y'all to tell us what your whys are in the chat. I want to hear what, why you do this work, what brings you alive. And let's just take a second to share that with each other and, and feel seen in these incredible different pathways that brought us here. As you keep putting these in here, I'm going to chat a little more because we're going to go into a co-visioning exercise. Um, but first, as we talk about some of our whys, I just want to make a quick point about letting go of outcomes because it's really important. Um, you know, the way that we keep our why nimble is to not be so attached to the outcomes of the work we do. And that's, you know, it's very hard to have certainty in an uncertain world, but it's also hard to not be attached to the outcomes of the work we do. And uh, there's a Nelson Henderson quote that I might I didn't write it down. So again, it might not be a direct quote, but it's something along the lines of um, perhaps the meaning of life is to plant trees under whose shade we will never sit. And we really like to think about doing that at Good Grief Network. We plant seeds because we don't know when and for who and where they are going to sprout. That's why we plant seeds. We do the work that inspires us without knowing the outcome because it's another instance of someone doing inspiring work in the world. We don't do it because we think it will solve a problem for sure. We do it because how else would we live through these times? What else would we choose? It is in our blood as solar punks and as change makers to offer our bombs B-A-L-M-S, ourselves to the world. It's in our blood. And there's a question I think of a lot. What would you do if your mother were sick? Maybe you can't cure her, but you don't want her to live out her final days in misery, right? Like you want her to live out her days in comfort and beauty. And that's what we're doing for our mother planet. And that's what we're doing here in this movement is we're giving what we can and we're making art and we're giving our tiny love letters of a utopian world to this world. And she's listening. And I think it's just so important to believe that these letters matter, not because they will achieve something, but because we wrote them. It's another instance of our, us pouring our love into this world that we love. So Andrew's going to lead us into the beginning of a co-visioning exercise that we do a lot at Good Grief Network. And this is, you know, speaking of little love letters to utopian worlds, this is kind of that. I, I think at the start of the day, too, Andrew Sage also talked about not what is, but what if. And that's in the spirit of this, too. It's a co-visioning exercise uh, where we work together to imagine new futures and new worlds and new paradigms. And I want to add a little thought before we do it. Um, I love this exercise. I love hearing what others have to share that I would never think of and, and how they build on each other and mesh together. Uh, and today at the conference, throughout the day, I've, I've heard so many inspiring and like lucid and clear ideas for building a future. Uh, but I do want to admit that I, I find it personally really challenging sometimes to envision that future. Uh, I think it's for two reasons. One, it's it's overwhelming sometimes to think of all the work that it takes to uh, achieve the world we wanna make. And, and two, I think it can require decentering ourselves often to build this world, giving up privileges based on race, on class, on nationality, and consciously and unconsciously that can, that can be uncomfortable. It's a reason you know it's so important, we think, to find allies, to build partnerships, to create inter intersectionality for stronger movements and, and deeper perspectives. Uh, but for both of these reasons, I, you know, we admire the strength and the courage it takes to gravitate toward disruptive, 
hopeful narratives and instead of the dystopic ones that, that kind of force us to resign ourselves to, to, to believing we can't change things. Uh, and so I, I guess I want to begin the, the exercise with an invitation to be courageous in naming things without being sure how we get there. That's a big part of what this is about. Great. Thank you, Andrew. And I want to give credit to our founders for creating this exercise because it's really powerful and it has transformed me so many times over. Um, and those people are Laura Schmidt and Amy Lewis Rowe. So this is our co-visioning exercise. We're going to ask three questions, but we're going to ask them in order. I'm going to tell you what they are first so that you understand the full exercise, and then we'll go through each one individually. The questions that we are going to ponder together are first, what are we bringing with us into these new paradigms that we're creating? The second is what are we leaving behind? What's not coming with us to these new paradigms? And then the third is what's a trait of your personality or each of our individual personalities, but we're speaking to each of you specifically, what's a trait of your personality that you want to see replicated in the cultures of the future? What's something you love about yourself that you hope is part of our human culture? So we're going to start with the first one and I'm going to invite you to answer in the chat. So we're going to start with the first one. What are we bringing into these new paradigms? And what I'm bringing in is community gardens on every corner. And again, we don't have to know how we're going to achieve this, but we're going to talk about what we want to achieve together because as we know here, we can only build what we can imagine. So let's imagine this beautiful world. And you can start putting it in the chat. What are we bringing into the new paradigms with us? Universal healthcare, libraries of things everywhere, curiosity, yes. Stories to help us imagine a way forward, maker spaces, and empathy and connection, biophilic design, barter and gift economies, yes, the right to fail, valuing all life, love and compassion, helping the elderly, education that teaches a love of history, accessibility. I'll say children as teachers, we're bringing in children as teachers, reconnecting to children and nature, housing for all. I see ancestral agriculture in the Q&A. I saw libraries of things everywhere, which I've heard so much about today and I never thought of before. Restoration of mental health with natural spaces. Yes, networks of eco-villages. Silliness. Andrew and I, I fully right. support that. Go 100 ahead. 100 silliness. I love that. We're going to move into the second part of this. What are we leaving behind? What is not invited into the new paradigms? And I'll kick us off with borders. National borders are not invited. We're leaving behind borders. And while we're at it, we're leaving behind billionaires. We're leaving behind millionaires and heirs. We're leaving behind all the heirs. Leaving behind the narrative of scarcity. Again, yes, prisons, fear of our feelings, undemocratic workplaces. Andrew, jump in if you're seeing someone missing. The patriarchy, guilt, fossil fuels. No more kings, please. No more oppression. The narrative of scarcity. That's great. Yes. Fear, fear of our feelings, leaving that behind. Yeah. Colonialism, waste, weapons, pollution, technological hopium. Yes, Speciesism. ignorance. Speciesism, mindless consumerism, commodification of basic needs, weapons. Yes, y'all. Nihilism, the grind. We're definitely leaving behind the grind. When I grew up, the grind was a dance move, and now it's become something much less fun. Okay. Unmet basic needs, plastic, single-use plastic, capitalism, anthrocentrism. Nice, y'all. Yeah, advertising. Love that. And thank you all for entering your voices in here. It's really nice to see the chats. And I'm going to move us into the third part of this exercise, which is What's a trait of your personality that will be replicated in the cultures of the future? What's something you really love about yourself? I see compassion. Lindsay ended, entered compassion into the chat. Curiosity. Um, mine is my ability to say I'm sorry when I've made a mistake. Humility, passion, creativity, love of the earth and nature. I'm goofy as fuck, says Jasper. Open yeah, heart. silliness. I've been told I'm a good listener. 
deep sense for beauty, empathy, awareness, vulnerability, self-reflection, intuition, acceptance and celebration of diversity, joy yeah. and failure, resilience, ability to hold space for others, right on. Yeah, humility, seeing others happy, desire to keep learning, continually experimenting a passion for knowledge. And I want you to feel those. When you say that, when you type in what you're proud of for yourself, feel that. Think about how important that skill is for building the futures that we're creating together. It's indispensable. An open mind, a nurturance of others, freedom to be oneself without fear, scrutinizing things openly. Jar collection, Australia, I'm with you. My, my jar collection's coming too. I'm definitely a jar lady. Resourcefulness. Cats, the cats are definitely invited. Skepticism, nice Reb. Thank y'all. <laughs> We've got more cats and discernment. Nice, the ability to be discerning. <laughs> I guess for a cat group. I don't know if I would have guessed that, but nice. Thank y'all. Um, it, it, things are still pouring into the chat, but we only have five minutes left in this session, which is gonna cut our time for questions a little short, but I just think this exercise is so powerful that I really wanted to create space for it. And definitely that's a hell yes to SAS, bringing SAS into the future cultures. Um, look at the worlds that we're creating together and look how many people know their role in that world already. That's beautiful. And we only have a few minutes left. I wonder, Andrew, can you just share the screen about GGN for me, please? Um, before we get, um, it's actually the next one, but thank you. So, um, you know, we think it's really important to do this work in community. And that's because a single nervous system can not hold all of these emotions that we're all holding. Um, there's a quote we really like. Ours is not the task of fixing the entire world at once, but of stretching out to mend the part of the world that is within our reach. And that's from Clarissa Pincola Estes. And that's what we do at the Grief Network. We create spaces for everyone to find their role in meaningful action, whatever that means to you, wherever your experiences and skills and passions intersect. And we do this in community. And I want to invite you to join us. There are a bunch of ways you can join us. Um, I'm going to drop a few links in the chat for our upcoming 10-step programs, our founder's book, and our new resilience program for teens. I saw we have a lot of parents here with us today. And teens, you know, I wasn't taught a lot of these skills in school. I had to learn a lot of these for myself as an adult. But I think that to the extent that we can equip our young people, um, we, you know, they really deserve to walk into a world that's a little more manageable than what we're giving them. And so helping them build resilience at an early age is really important. I'm going to just pause for a second and make some space for questions. I know we only have a few minutes, but um, I'm also going to put in our email address at the bottom. And if you want to ask us some questions after this is over, you're welcome to. We have a, a question in the, the Q&A. Hi there. Um, Senke? I hear that the question, I'll read it for everyone. I don't know if everyone can get it. Is do you offer and or have contacts for in Europe or in this case, Germany? And I will say that I am Europe based. And so Good Grief Network is all over the world. We actually do have facilitators in Austria right now. I think we just trained a new, two new facilitators in Germany in the last few months. And so we are going to be expanding our 10 step groups to Europe. We already have 10 step groups in European time zones, but they're digital. If you're looking for an in-person group, we don't have any in Germany yet, but because we just trained some new facilitators there, it might be that they decide to offer in-person groups. But we offer 10 step groups, which are these peer to peer support groups in every time zone that we can accommodate. And that's because we have facilitators all over the world. But um, if you're interested in this work, there are absolutely spaces in your, in your time zone. And Claire's reminded us that you can use the raise hand or Q and A feature if y'all have any questions. And cause we only have a short amount of time left, I'll just say, well, maybe one more question's coming in that we're really grateful that you chose to spend this time with us today. It's really hard to look at these heavy feelings because we're living through a crisis that is unprecedented. 
And it takes so much courage to look at these feelings, to hold them and to do it in community. And y'all are very brave and inspiring. And I'm just so grateful to share space with you. I want to remind y'all that we'll send out a packet with some of the resources that we use today, some ways that you can build community yourselves and with us and some other ways to access this peer support work in the future. Andrew, is there anything you want to say? Just another thank you for joining us and thank you to the organizers too for, for working with us to make this a great session. Yeah, thank you all so much to the Solar Punk organizers. They've been doing so much work for this and so responsive through emails. It was really easy to coordinate with them. We're really grateful for your work.